Okay, so let's have a look at what we want to build in this lab. So we have the following situation. We imagine that we have an environment with different types of equipment. In the uh, explanation and in the lab, uh, we will use three different printers. And what we want to do is to help this guy. So this guy is a system administrator. And what he would like to do is to have some kind of dashboard that gives him information, live information about the uh, the equipment in his environment. So you could think of the um, the ink level or incidents that would be detected by sensors uh, on the printers, and that would be somehow aggregated and presented to the to the user. So the question is, how do we how do we build that, and how can we use a web infrastructure to build a system like this. So what we would need to, to do to implement a solution like this is first to have some kind of sensors and some kind of communication infrastructure to collect data from the sensors. So here we use the Novacom modules. Novacom is a startup uh, spin-off from the Asher GVD, which is building sensors and communication modules for Internet of Things modules. So imagine that we use these modules and that we connect them to the to the printers. And then what we would do is to set up some kind of web infrastructure. So on this diagram, I'm showing that with a single server but you could imagine that is actually a collection of servers or that it is something that is hosted somewhere in the cloud. Now, of course, there needs to be an integration uh, between this web infrastructure and the Novacom communication uh, network, which is why I represent here a, a Novacom module. So what happens is that uh, you more or less continuously have information that is pushed uh, from the sensors to the web infrastructure. There it's processed, it's analyzed, it's aggregated. And then when the user is using the uh, web dashboard, uh, it's sending requests to the web infrastructure and the web infrastructure uh, presents the, uh, the, the, the sensor data in a way that is easy to, uh, to read, easy to understand by the, by the user. So that's essentially what we are going to, um, to build in the lab. Of course, it's going to be a very uh, simplified uh, version. It's going to be a simulator. And it's a system that we will call MONSYS for uh, system monitoring. So in the lab, uh, you will see this URL, www.monsys.com. It's not a real company. It's not a real URL. It's just something that we have made up for the lab, for the uh, purpose of the, of the lab. So now let's have a closer look at the uh, web infrastructure, so the, the central piece of the uh, equipment. In the lab, we will simulate the, the sensors. We will pretend that we have sensors, but actually we will just generate random data. So in the setup, of course, we will use a web browser, any kind of web browser. And the first thing that we will use is a static HTTP server. So we will use uh, Apache. And Apache will be responsible to serve static content, meaning HTML files, uh, CSS files, and JavaScript files. So that's the first uh, type of uh, web or HTTP interaction that we will uh, see in the lab. The browser is going to send requests to the monsys.com host. We will use a um, non-standard uh, port to avoid any issues with, uh, with um, administrative rights on, on your machine. So here I'm sending a request to port 9090. And then what happens is that first the browser is going to get the HTML file. 
the HTML file will reference uh, CSS and JavaScript files that will be uh, fetched in subsequent HTTP requests. So that's fairly easy and that's something that we could do very easily just with a plain Apache HTTPD server. Now, remember that we also have dynamic data. Uh, here we will simulate the, the data that is uh, reported by the, uh, the, the sensors. And to do that, we have written a very simple Node.js application that computes uh, random values, uh, put them together, and generate uh, a JSON payload. And this JSON payload is returned to the, to the, to the client. So it's something that is extremely basic. The idea is that you can send several requests to the Node.js uh, server, and every time you will get different values for these uh, sensor simulators. So what happens is that it's really the JavaScript running in the browser that is going to send AJAX requests to the Node.js uh, backend every second. An AJAX request is a request that is sent from the browser but without doing a page refresh. So you could think of it as a background request. You have loaded some HTML content in your page, you have rendered it, and in the background, you have other HTTP requests that are made, data is fetched, and then very, very often what happens is that the, the, the JavaScript uh, updates uh, portions of the DOM uh, with, the, uh, with the, the fetched data. So here, what we have is a series of HTTP requests and notice that we have a special prefix, ajax slash resources. Um, and this is then used to direct the, the, the request to the, to the Node.js server. Now, what we need is to have an extra component in the infrastructure, which is here labeled as nginx. Uh, Nginx is a particular software, it's an implementation of uh, the HTTP protocol, but uh, conceptually it's a reverse proxy. So you might remember from the course that one reason to introduce the, the reverse proxy is to be able to hide the details of the web infrastructure. So from the outside it will not be possible for users to know that there is an Apache server, that there is a Node.js server. Um, people will just see the single URL, monsys.com, and everything behind the Nginx uh, reverse proxy will be, uh, will be uh, hidden. That's one role of the uh, reverse proxy. The other role is that um, um, the, the reverse proxy is responsible for doing the routing, for forwarding the request to the, to the, to the proper uh, host. How will it be able to do that? Well, in that case, it's really by looking at the prefix of the URL, and the rule is very simple. If the URL after the port starts with the string AJAX, then Nginx knows that it must forward the request to the Node.js server. If it doesn't, then it should send the uh, request to the Apache HTTPD server. That's a rule that we have uh, made up. It, it fits our needs in this, uh, in this setup. For other types of systems, the, the mapping rules might be uh, slightly more complex, but the idea is always the same. You look at the incoming HTTP request coming from the, uh, the, the browser, and then based on either portions of the host name or prefix values uh, in, the, in the path, you decide where you want to go. The last thing that we will see in the lab, notice here that we have added a new node uh, which is also an Apache HTTPD server. In the course, you probably remember that we've talked about load balancing, we've talked about scalability, we've talked about availability. 
and the fact that in many infrastructures you don't want to have a single component of a particular uh, node and that you want to distribute requests between equivalent nodes. So that's what we will uh, do. We will have several nodes implementing the functionality of the uh, static HTTP, the, uh, HTTP server. And uh, Nginx will allow us to distribute the, the, the requests between these uh, different nodes. So in a nutshell, that's what we will uh, build um, and evaluate in the in the lab. Uh, we will implement all of that in a virtualized environment. So everything will work in a Linux uh, virtual machine. And in the Linux virtual machine, we will use Docker uh, to um, to run lightweight containers. And every gray box that you see here, so the reverse proxy the two web servers and the uh, node server that we will call the app server. Uh, these four boxes will be implemented as four Docker containers. So let's have a quick look at uh, how, it, uh, how it looks like. So I'm here in a, in a browser and what I'm going to do is to access monsys.com on port 9090. Uh, I'm really going to access a server or an infrastructure running on my machine. So what I've done is done a mapping in my slash etc slash hosts file. And I've uh, aliased my, uh, my uh, VM IP address to this, uh, to this uh, DNS uh, name. So what we see here is the very fancy uh, user interface of Monsys. So it's, it's extremely simple. There is no, um, no uh, graphical representation. Uh, you see that there is some static content. So it's basically the HTML uh, content that was fetched um, from, the, from the server. And then in the middle, you have dynamic value. You see that there is an ID or a name, there is a device description, and then there is this load value, which is changing all the time. So what I'm going to do is to have a look at the developer tool, look at what is, what is happening on the uh, network, and you see that every second or so, you have an HTTP request that is fired from the browser and that is going uh, to the web infrastructure. So if I click on one of them, we see that the target URL is monsys.com port 1990 slash ajax slash resources slash notes. So this URL is going to arrive at the reverse proxy level the reverse proxy is going to see that there is this ajax prefix and it will therefore forward the request to um, to the node.js uh, server if we look at the response we see that there is a there is a json payload that is returned by uh, by node.js with the name the description and the current load level it's an array we have three values and what our um, JavaScript is doing is essentially uh, parsing these uh, or iterating over this, uh, this uh, data structure. You can see that the uh, JavaScript is extremely basic. This is where we do the, um, the, the Ajax call. We receive some data, we parse the data, and we update the DOM. So that's, uh, that's it. Um, very quickly, uh, I'm here in a terminal. So I'm here at the uh, operating system level and we will use several tools. So I mentioned Docker previously. Um, 
We will also use Vagrant. Uh, Vagrant is a tool that makes it easier to work with um, VirtualBox and other virtualization technologies. Um, it allows me to, to, to do the, the initial setup uh, of my uh, virtual machine and to do some, uh, some configuration in an automated way. So I'm going to use a command here, Vagrant SSH, to connect to my box. So you notice here that I'm still in the terminal. The uh, invite of the shell has changed. And I'm now in the virtual box virtual machine. So if I use these commands, I see that I'm not on macOS anymore. I'm really on a Linux uh, environment. I'm on a Ubuntu distribution. Okay. What I can do is use the uh, Docker uh, command. And there is a subcommand named Docker PS. So if I do a Docker PS, I get the list of these lightweight containers. So if you remember, let me quickly jump. What I said before is that every gray box, so the reverse proxy, the web servers, and the app server, they would be implemented as Docker containers. That's essentially what we see here. We have four running containers. They have names. So there is an app node. That's the Node.js one. We have two web nodes. These are the Apache uh, nodes. And RP for reverse proxy. That's the uh, Nginx um, box. You see here that uh, every container is started with a, um, with a specific command. So the app node is launched. Uh, when it's launched, it's uh, starting a Node.js process with a particular script. Uh, the web nodes, they start the Apache uh, daemon. And then for uh, reverse proxy, it's a custom shell script I had to write, but it's essentially running the Nginx uh, daemon. Very interesting here. You see that there is some port mapping information. Um, with Docker's, um, we have a special a virtual bridge that is uh, set up for us. And what it allows me to do is to establish a TCP connection on the VM, on these ports. And then this is mapped to the container IP addresses and port. So essentially, it means that the app node has a running process that is listening on port 80. And that if I do a connection, if I establish a connection on the VM IP address on this port, a connection is actually going to be established with the process running in the container on port 80. So let me try that. If I do a telnet localhost, Ninety ninety. So I'm going to, or let me try to connect to uh, 70, 70. So I'm going to connect to the uh, Node.js. I see that I'm now connected. And it's a Node.js server, so I can send uh, an HTTP uh, request. Monsys.com. And I get a response, and we see here the uh, JSON payload that I've seen before. Uh, similarly, if I do a telnet on port 8081,
I'm now going to talk to the Apache server and I get my uh, static content. That's the uh, HTML page that we have seen uh, before with the, the, the gray background. Let me do a Docker PS again. The last thing I'm going to try is to uh, send a request to the reverse proxy. So telnet localhost 1990. And now first let's see if I send an invalid value in the host header we see that the uh, reverse proxy is uh, not too happy and it's closing the, the, the connection. So the reverse proxy is really enforcing valid values in the, um, in the host header, which I'm going to do now. And I get the, uh, the, 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 the value. We are in HTTP 1.1, so I uh, don't have my uh, TCP connection uh, closed. And what I can do is send another HTTP request. And here I'm really uh, simulating an AJAX request. And remember what I said before, the URL start with the AJAX substring which means that I should get a response from Node.js, which is really the case here. We have our uh, JSON payload. Uh, and what's interesting is we see here that uh, Node.js is uh, sending us a uh, chunked uh, encoding. If I type something invalid, then Node.js will not be uh, too happy and will close the connection. That's it uh, for the, uh, the uh, introduction to the, to the lab. You will now have to dig into the, the configuration and um, see this setup on your uh, machine for yourself.